Elizabeth II has been queen for over 50 years. She is head of state, head of the Church of England, and head of the armed forces. She has the power to make or break a government, sack a prime minister, and declare war. She has been a constant presence, preserving the monarchy in a fast-changing world. But how successful has she been, and what has been the price of her survival? This film examines ten key days from her reign. Ten days when Elizabeth II had to decide what it meant to be queen. From the day she first realized she was going to inherit the throne, to the day when she feared she had lost the support of her people. It has turned out to be an annus horribilis. From the evening she cried for the first time in public, to the afternoon when she feared that she might be jeered out of her own home. Ten days that changed the British monarchy. Ten days that made the Queen. In 1936, Elizabeth Windsor was the ten-year-old daughter of the Duke of York. Her uncle David had just become King Edward VIII and hoped to marry Mrs. Wallace Simpson, a divorced woman. But it was almost impossible for the King as head of the Church of England to marry a divorcee. So Edward VIII was faced with a stark choice between Mrs. Simpson, the woman he loved, and the throne of the United Kingdom. It was a choice that would decide his niece's future and shape her moral life. For Mrs. Simpson was about to become the most hated member of the Windsor family. Wallace Simpson had considerable qualities. I mean, she was elegant to a fault. She was quick, she was sharp, she was funny. She had for the Prince of Wales, King Edward VIII, the priceless attribute of being American and scornful of the British Maury. She did not have the automatic reverence for the monarch, which any English woman he'd ever met always had. She was prepared to treat him like dirt, and I think he was a man who throve on that. There was certainly an element of masochism in a relationship, and, and for all I know, sadism too. Whether this was something that was worked out physically, heaven knows, nobody ever will know. But there is no doubt that he relished the humiliations which he heaped upon him, and loved being in the role of a kind of cringing lover rather than an omnipotent monarch. The scandal was kept from Elizabeth for as long as possible. But it was made clear that her uncle was either going to have to give up Mrs. Simpson or abdicate the throne. On December the 10th, 1936, he chose abdication. I have found it impossible to carry the heavy burden of responsibility and to discharge my duties as king as I would wish to do, without the help and support of the woman I love. The instrument of abdication was signed on December the 10th, 1936. One has to realise that abdication strikes at the heart of monarchy. One Victorian novelist said, what suicide is to a man, abdication is to a king because the idea of voluntary renunciation of monarchy strikes at the heart of the idea of automatic hereditary succession. On December the 11th, the Duke of York went to St James's Palace and was proclaimed King George VI. Elizabeth was now next in line to the throne. When her parents told her they were moving to Buckingham Palace, she replied, What? You mean forever? 
I think everyone had been so stunned by the, the abdication. And uh, I think the princesses must have, um, of course, become well aware that life was going to be very different. And they were going to begin with, they were going to have to move. And no children liked doing that. And they'd have to go to move to this enormous palace across the way. And they would realize their parents were going to be far, far more busy and less able to spend time with them than they had before. Princess Elizabeth, of course, was old enough to understand what it all meant and what her future meant. But I think in many ways it must have felt like the end of childhood. Humiliated by the abdication crisis, Elizabeth's family were now determined to atone for Edward VIII's indiscretion. I think that both the Queen and her father, King George VI, and her grandmother, Queen Mary, were possessed by the most grinding sense of duty. Nothing was going to interfere between them and doing what they thought they ought to do for the country, what was right. The dereliction, as they saw it, of King Edward VIII, I'm certainly reinforced that, made him even more convinced that the country must come first and our own personal tastes and interests second. The moral corset of the 1930s w w was quite an easy one to wear, you know, that, that you were very moral, that you were upright, that you upheld Christian values, but absolutely everything came secondary to the sense of morality, which is absolute poison, I think, to family life. None who had watched the former Duke of York at his father's funeral could have foreseen the events which led to the tremendous burden of kingship to be placed upon his shoulders. The Windsors decided to make their needs subservient to the requirements of monarchy, and that from now on they would become the ideal Christian family. In order to preserve the future of the monarchy, Elizabeth was taught to live an exemplary life. But were the standards the Windsors set themselves too high to meet? And could they become a curse that would blight the royal family? On the 22nd of July 1939, the Princess Elizabeth visited the Royal Naval College at Dartmouth, accompanied by her parents and her sister. She was 13 years old, but there were already ideas about whom she might marry, for it was vital that the future Queen chose the right sort of consort to secure the winds alive. We were very honoured, really, because the royal yacht came in majestically into the River Dart and moored. And then, of course, the rain started uh, straight away, which was most unfortunate. Royal weather was not present at the time. They had a rather ancient Rolls Royce, which looked as though it ought to have been used for funerals. And that drove them from the uh, quay at Dartmouth. <laughs> Among the cadets was 18-year-old Prince Philip Mountbatten of Greece, whose uncle, Lord Louis Mountbatten, an up-and-coming naval officer, attended the King and Queen that day. Mountbatten was passionately anxious that his family ties with the British royal family should be emphasised and made ever closer. He was also a born matchmaker, he prided himself on busying himself in the lives of his friends and relations and trying to impose his, his idea of what our happiness should be on them. So I think it is more than likely that when the fateful visit to Dartmouth took place, Mountbatten had at the back of his mind a feeling that this could one day work out to something. Lord Mountbatten knew precisely what he was doing. 
Prince Philip was 18, tall, handsome, and uh, the Queen was only 13 and uh, looked up to him and it was pretty obvious what the inevitable effect would be. Mountbatten made sure his nephew spent as much time with the future Queen as possible. It didn't matter how young she was. This was too good an opportunity to miss. Philip showed the young princess round the college and even played croquet with her on the lawn. He was a dashing young man and he was amazingly dashing and I think people you know, tend to forget that when they see him just as an, an old bloke. You know, there was this fantastic Viking, he had this almost um, sort of white blonde hair and he was fit and he was good looking and he was, you know, obviously everybody's Prince Charming. At the Abbey door came a greeting from Prince Philip of Greece who was kept very busy acting as an usher. Prince Philip stands on the right. Not everyone at court approved. He was Greek from the German side of the royal family, which, for obvious reasons, didn't gel with what people wanted at that immediate post-war period. And he was also known to be in possession of his own mind. <laughs> he was not going to be pushed around. He was uh, somebody who, uh, as has been proved, of course, over the um, length of the marriage, was his own man. So for those reasons, it was wondered whether or not he'd make the ideal husband. But his uncle was determined to prepare the ground. He built Philip up as the nephew of Lord Louis Mountbatten, rather than an impoverished Greek prince. One whose naval training at Dartmouth had made him properly British. And Princess Elizabeth was adamant. This was the man she wanted to marry. The wedding took place on the 20th of November 1947. It was a spectacular occasion, in stark contrast to the troubles of Edward and Mrs Simpson, as Philip and Elizabeth gave the royal family a popular dash of post-war glamour. There had been a ball the night before, which for me, you know, was very exciting. And for the first time, because I was, you know, a child of the war, and so to see um, all these people dressed up in, in fantastic jewellery. But of course, the, um, the, the, most of the British people wearing, wearing their jewellery, I thought looked very magnificent and, and beautiful. But um, Queen Juliana of the Netherlands, I remember saying, heard her saying in rather a loud voice, oh, look, their jewellery, it is all so dirty because I suppose people were so unused to wearing their baubles, they hadn't had time to take them out and have them cleaned. But for me, they shone wonderfully. But despite the romance of the occasion, being the future queen mattered more than being Philip's wife. Although his uncle had boasted that the House of Mountbatten now reigned, any idea that Philip would give his name to the royal family was quickly quashed. Mountbatten earnestly hoped that as a result of the royal marriage, the house of Mountbatten-Windsor would reign over the British Isles, the British Commonwealth. The Queen, I think probably, uh, on the advice of ministers, with the strong support of her mother, was having none of it. I mean, she had felt the House of Windsor was still the House of Windsor, and there was no possible reason for fiddling around with titles. She didn't much like fiddling around with things anyway. And this particular case, it was quite recently that the House of Windsor had begun to reign, and she really saw no grounds whatsoever for um, so rapidly evolving yet again and um, complicating things by bringing in a new name. The issue of the surname was settled with the Queen's proclamation of the 7th of April 1952, stating that I and my children shall be styled as the house and family of Windsor, and that my descendants who marry and their descendants shall bear the name of Windsor.
Prince Philip himself was personally furious with this. For the last eight dynasties going back a thousand years, the man's title is the one that is taken as the name of the of the royal house. One thinks of uh, the house of Saxe Coburg Gotha, which came in as a result of Prince Albert marrying Queen Victoria. This for the first time, breaking precedent, it wasn't going to happen. He was furious. He said, what do they think I am, a bloody amoeba? The Queen in Elizabeth had spoken. Keeping the Windsor name was what mattered most. I think the Queen has been surprisingly firm with her consort. He's a consort with a small C, and she's a Queen with a capital Q. Uh, and he has always... Um, played a, a, a very subordinate role to her. He hasn't been shown the, um, the, the, the secret documents and so on. He hasn't been uh, made what Prince Albert was to Queen Victoria, namely her, her private secretary, you know, that, and Prince Albert was a kind of quasi-king. Uh, Philip has never been anything approaching that, partly because the crusty old courtiers were, uh, d d didn't entirely trust him, partly because I think the Queen adheres to duty more than anything else, and she felt that it was her duty to, uh, to conduct the affairs of the monarchy, and partly perhaps because um, <clears throat> He's, he's, he's really, a, you know, he's quite erratic, uh, um, Philip, and um, he, he sometimes says the first thing that comes into his head, which turns out to be highly undiplomatic. So, I mean, she, she is actually much sort of better, I think, um, in her rather po-faced way at um, maintaining the decencies than he is. In February 1952, Philip and Elizabeth were on holiday together in Kenya when news came of the death of King George VI. Elizabeth was queen, and with her accession came all the duties and responsibilities of the monarchy. Her lady-in-waiting, Pamela Hicks, accompanied Elizabeth on the flight home. We were coming into land at London Airport, and she was leaning over my shoulder and looking down through the portholes, and she said, oh, I can't see my car. And then she said, oh, They've sent the hearses, which is what she used to call the big royal limousines, those big black monsters. And suddenly one thought, here is this 25-year-old young woman and her husband, who is a professional sailor, destined to get to the top of his profession, two small children, and this is the end of their private life. From now on, for the rest of their lives, they are public property. The coronation was held at Westminster Abbey on June 2nd, 1953. This was the day when Elizabeth was made to realise the overwhelming significance of what she had taken on. She had become the embodiment of the nation. I here present unto you Queen Elizabeth, your undoubted Queen. Wherefore all you who are come this day to do your homage and service are you willing to do the same? The coronation was a fantastic occasion. I mean, it comes once in a lifetime. All the peers and peeresses, of course, got dressed up in their robes and their coronets and things. A lot of sort of mothball odor around all over the place. And the peers keeping the odd sandwich in their coronets, you know, because it was a long day. You had to be there early and we had to stay late. But I think it was a day that nobody who was there would obviously ever forget. It was a marvellous, marvellous thing to have seen and experienced. I, Philip, will become your liege man of light and limb, and of earthly worship. In faith and truth I will bear unto you 
live and die. Prince Philip kneeling before her as her liege lord of life and limb and getting up and kissing her and knocking the crown sideways. <laughs> but one does understand how um, very, very deeply the Queen feels about her role because in the coronation she was anointed with special oil and she is very religious and feels it was a sacrament. As a committed Christian, Elizabeth recognized that the high point of the service was when she was anointed with holy oil to become the servant of her people. She considered the moment to be so private and so sacred that it could not be televised. Thence goes Queen Elizabeth to sit in King Edward's chair for the most sacred rite of her anointing. A canopy was borne over her in the traditional manner by four knights of the garter. Again to conceal and hide that sacred moment. Uh, really from the congregation or anyone present seeing it, it's a deeply intimate moment, you know, almost kind of sacrament being enacted. And then Archbishop Fisher advanced and anointed her on her palms of her hands, on her breast and on her head. That moment is the moment when, as, she, as it were, she crossed from being one person into being the embodiment of the nation, from being the queen as a woman to being the queen as ruler, as a person set apart, a person whose life was to be dedication to her people, come what may. We have a monarch. The question is, why? <laughs> the question is, who says? And I think Elizabeth has taken the view that this oath is what legitimizes her. Consequently, this is, I think, the reason why remaining the Supreme Governor of the Church of England has been so important to her. But the religious significance of the ceremony was to have a profound impact on Elizabeth's immediate family. The cost of the coronation, in personal and monarchical terms, was very great indeed because the monarch and her family had to live up to the high standards, the vows that she had sworn um, in the abbey. And this, and she was, she was then um, the, the head of the Church of England, and Princess Margaret even described her on one occasion as God's representative on earth. <laughs> That's pretty, high, pretty important stuff. And what that, that meant, of course, was that Margaret herself was going to have to live up to these very, very high standards. And they were almost impossible to live up to. Within two years, the Queen came into direct conflict with her sister. On the 21st of August, 1955, Margaret reached the age of 25 and hoped that she would now be of an age to marry Group Captain Peter Townsend with whom she was in love. But Captain Townsend was divorced. Fewer than 20 years before, Edward and Mrs. Simpson had nearly ruined the royal family. Now, if Margaret married a divorcee, it would undermine the moral authority that Elizabeth believed to lie at the heart of monarchy. Duty came first, protocol came first, the country came first. But this was a very beloved sister, somebody who she'd grown up with in an extraordinarily sort of insulated and insular childhood. And you would have thought that um, anyone would have done whatever they possibly could to make somebody happy in those circumstances. And I think a sister's happiness was fairly low down the pecking order of priorities for the Queen. At that time, it was felt by the establishment, if not by the Queen herself, that it couldn't happen. And the Queen, to a certain extent, was cast in the role of the person who had to actually forbid her little sister from achieving happiness. So it wouldn't be human if she didn't feel a sort of guilt about the whole thing. But I think the Queen has always put duty and obligation and service above everything else. And this was manifestly not what was happening with the younger sister. 
Buckingham Palace sought advice from the Prime Minister Anthony Eden, who was himself divorced. But both he and the Queen agreed that the relationship was a step too far for a member of the royal family and refused to sanction the marriage. The following statement has just been issued from Clarence House by Her Royal Highness Princess Margaret. I would like it to be known that I have decided not to marry Group Captain Peter Townsend. Mindful of the Church's teaching that Christian marriage... And so on the 31st of October 1955, Margaret gave up her love for Captain Peter Townsend. The Queen had made it clear that the continuation of the monarchy and her role as defender of the faith was more important than anything else. She had cast aside the sensitivities of her husband over his surname. Now she blocked her sister's future happiness. But when the Queen became embroiled in the murkier world of politics and global affairs, she was to find it far more difficult to retain her integrity. When the Queen exceeded the throne, she became head of state and head of the armed forces, the ruler of a country with a proud sense of both its military power and its parliamentary democracy. But within three years, she was to learn that there were limits to her role as head of state, whatever the constitution said, and that British imperial power was in terminal decline. On July the 26th, 1956, her British Prime Minister Anthony Eden was hosting a formal dinner at 10 Downing Street in London. His guests were King Faisal of Iraq and his Prime Minister, Nuri as Said. In the midst of the dinner, the Prime Minister was handed a note telling him that the Egyptian dictator Gamal Nasser had nationalized the company running the Suez Canal. At the time, the Suez Canal, which connected the Mediterranean to the Red Sea, controlled 80% of Western Europe's oil supplies. It was run by a combined British and French company, and Nasser now planned to take its profits for himself. This was a direct challenge to British and French financial interests in the canal. Eden immediately broke off the dinner and summoned his senior ministers to an all-night meeting. All the chief of the Imperial General Staff and all the military people and people from dinners all over London and there were people in black ties and people in white tie and tails. Gateskill, the leader of the opposition, was there. Uh, and the meeting went on um, really till 2, 3 a.m. It wasn't really perhaps the, the best time to take very sudden decisions. The cabinet decided they would not be bullied by a foreign dictator. They had seen the British failure in trying to appease Hitler before the Second World War. They were not going to make Chamberlain's mistake all over again. Then the French government came with a secret plan. Rather than attack Egypt directly and risk war in the Middle East, Israel would attack Egypt instead. And then the French and British troops would go in, separate the combatants and reoccupy the canal, pretending all the time that they were acting as peacemakers. It was a risky strategy which required the utmost secrecy. A secret some think that the Prime Minister may even have kept from the Queen herself. Was she told, for example, about the plan of collusion with Israel, in which Israel attacked Egypt? and Britain 
had a police action to split the combatants, which was all prearranged by Eden with the Israelis. Impossible to tell, and I would doubt it. I suspect what was happening was that she was warning him gently, but that Eden by that time had so much got the bit between his teeth. Many people thought that he was literally mad during the time of the Suez Crisis. He was so determined to put down NASA that NASA was another Mussolini or perhaps another Hitler and that he'd got to be squashed, that he wasn't going to listen to anybody, not even, um, not even the, the monarch. Certainly the full extent of the collusion with Israel was kept from Parliament. My grandfather was Chancellor and he, hadn't, he had no idea that this operation was going to take place until Miles Thomas, who was chairman of BOAC, rang him up and said, Harold, who is going to pay for all these aeroplanes that the government is hiring? And this was to fly the troops out to Jordan and various other places. I have no idea how far Antony had informed the Queen. He obviously had to before committing her troops to military action. But to this day, I don't think it's clear how well informed she was, any more than how quite a lot of other members of the government were informed. Israel attacked on Monday the 29th of October, 1956. The French and British forces began their invasion on October the 31st. The Queen became uneasy. She was staying at the home of Lord Louis Mountbatten, now the first Sea Lord. And Mountbatten believed that the government's strategy was deeply flawed. By chance, the Queen was at Broadlands when the balloon went up over the Suez Crisis. And Mountbatten hastened back between meetings. And he, he was so vehement in his views on Suez, and um, so keen on putting these views forward to all and sundry that it is inconceivable that the Queen did not hear a very negative view uh, of Eden's actions. My father felt very strongly about Suez, that it was an absolutely wrong action that we were getting involved in. He was commander-in-chief of the Mediterranean fleet at the time, which was a very vital position, of course, with Suez just down the way. And... Um, he had to have the fleet absolutely ready to sail at a minute's notice, although he was 100% against the idea of this being done. But as a serviceman, uh, he never naturally let politics enter into it and had to do what was the right thing for the job. Despite Mountbatten's advice, the Queen could do nothing to stop events unravelling. The crisis was now discussed at the United Nations in New York. I was very young, naive, idealistic almost, and I thought, well, here's Anthony Eden. Um, he's the best foreign secretary. He's really skilled. Now he's prime minister. He knows the Middle East backwards. He's doing this. It doesn't make sense to us here in New York, but we're only pawns. He must have, of course this man must have, a master plan, must know what he really wants to do. Uh, take the Suez Canal, right? Who's going to run Egypt? He must have, there must be an answer to these questions. And then it gradually dawned on us, there weren't no plan, uh, and it was as bad as it looked. After only three days, the Americans pressed for a ceasefire, believing at the time that it was both inadvisable and unethical to invade a Middle Eastern country without a UN mandate. The British were humiliated, and the Queen had been unable to do anything about it. No longer was the country seen to be able to fight wars without international support, and no longer could the country claim the moral high ground in questions of international affairs. The Suez Crisis was significant for the whole country, but particularly for the Queen. She had emerged as Queen during the last days of empire. She is a figure of the empire. Uh, that was her childhood, 
uh, she became queen while the empire was still functioning. What 1956 did was to give a big jolt, there's no question in my mind, a jolt to the whole British establishment, including the, uh, the monarch, uh, really the apex of the British establishment, about Britain's role in the world. Uh, it was quite clear the British and the French had invaded Egypt, a big row with the United States. The Americans had forced us to get out. The Americans were the new kid on the block and the new leader of the West. We couldn't be imperialists anymore in any formal sense. That's what Suez taught us. The Suez crisis went straight to the psyche of the British people, the national psyche was affected by it. Our attitude towards the Commonwealth, towards the United States, towards the nascent European community which uh, was set up the following year, our whole idea of what we were about in the world, whether we were a great power any longer, all of these were affected by Suez, and of course the Queen, uh, more than anybody else in fact in the country, would have been deeply, deeply affected by this. She had only been on the throne for three years, and suddenly everything seemed to be collapsing around her. It was a pretty terrible time for Britain, and a pretty terrible time for her. To many it seemed that the Queen had learned a hard lesson, that she was now little more than the titular head of a small European country. On October the 17th, 1963, just after 11 at night, the Queen made a private visit to the King Edward VII Hospital in London. Inside, Harold Macmillan, thinking that he was dying, had decided to resign both as Prime Minister and as leader of the Conservative Party. Macmillan wanted to choose his successor, and so, mindful of the royal prerogative that allowed the Queen to send for the next Prime Minister, he decided to exploit his friendship with Elizabeth and fix the succession against the expectations of his party. For although the Deputy Prime Minister, Rab Butler, was the favourite to take over, Macmillan preferred the grouse-shooting Scottish aristocrat, Alec Douglas Hume. He prepared a memorandum for the Queen in which he wrote, Lord Hume is clearly a man who represents the old governing class at its best, and those who take a reasonably impartial view of English history know how good that can be. He was, as they say, one of us. Good evening, sir. Yeah. So, is the leadership decision any clearer now? I'm nothing to say. No. Mm -hmm. We can't congratulate you yet, sir. I'm nothing to say. No. Mm -hmm. When will we know about the leadership, sir? Well, I don't know. But it's simple, actually. From his hospital bed, Macmillan read the memorandum out loud to the Queen, making it almost impossible for Butler to succeed him. I've never forgotten meeting him, you know. I knew at once by his eyes how very deceptive he was. And you see, he was determined that Rab was never going to succeed him as Prime Minister. He was absolutely determined, had been from the first day of his Prime Ministership to the last. And so, I blame him for the fact that he wasn't. He didn't advise the Queen to send for him. He'd, he never made it possible for Rab to become Prime Minister. Macmillan behaved abominably. But the Queen liked the idea of an aristocratic successor that she already knew, and so she sent for Alec Douglas Hume and asked him to try and form a government. Two prominent Conservatives, Enoch Powell and Ian MacLeod, refused to serve under Hume, angry that the so-called magic circle of the Tory aristocracy had fixed the succession. Hume immediately called Butler's bluff and asked him to serve under him. If Butler had refused, then it would have been impossible for a government to be formed. But for the sake of party unity, he agreed. Rab had never in all his life tried to get anything for himself. 
He was the most selfless person who ever lived. And when he was asked to serve, he thought, if it was the good of the country, he would. I was so heartbroken. I knew how wonderful he would have been. And I knew that he should have got it, if it hadn't been the intrigue of Macmillan. So naturally, I vowed never to speak to Macmillan again. And moreover, I did not. <laughs> 40 years of political life, I've tried to do my best. Macmillan had persuaded the Queen to send for an unelected leader. Both for my party and for my country. She is a rabbit frozen in the headlights. On one hand, she's got Macmillan telling her who she should pick. Clearly, he's constitutionally offside to be doing that in the first place. On the other hand, if she says, well, no, 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 you know, we, we must go with, with Butler, then she is directly involved in choosing a Conservative Prime Minister. She should have learnt, if nothing else, from that episode, uh, that there were very, um, uh, very good grounds for um, looking carefully at her own powers and those devolved to the Prime Minister of the day and uh, curtailing them where necessary. The Queen had sided with the aristocratic wing of the Conservative Party. Her position as an objective head of state had been compromised. Once her impartiality had been questioned, she decided to retreat from politics. From now on she would set herself apart and keep her political opinions strictly to herself. On the 22nd of January 1972, in a move which would profoundly diminish the Queen's sovereignty, the British Prime Minister Edward Heath signed the Treaty of Accession with the European Economic Community. For those at the meeting in Brussels, this signified a new European hope that only 27 years after the end of the Second World War, in which 62 million people had died, Europe was moving towards a union some of the protagonists thought little short of miraculous. We were at war in 1945. We'd been desperately at war twice in the last century. And what has taken shape since then is a Europe of 25 countries, almost all the important countries, um, on a basis of coming together on a basis of peace, no more killing each other, democracy, every single one a, a democratically elected government, um, and growing prosperity. It's amazing. It's never happened before. Uh, your father and mine would have thought it inconceivable because of the lives they'd lived through. Um, and yet it's there. But it was not universally popular. There were demonstrations throughout Britain. Those who disapproved felt that a closer relationship in Europe was nothing less than an assault on British independence and sovereignty. Edward Wilson or Enoch Powell, who likes our country, who likes the realm and sovereignty... Of Even worse, some considered it to be a direct attack on the powers of the Queen herself. I stand for the Queen. I stand for the realm, the sovereign of this nation. The impact was quite profound because what it meant was for the first time the British Parliament had signed a treaty, in effect, which said that where European and British law collide, uh, European law takes precedence. Now, this was right at the heart of the sovereignty issue. And, I mean, sovereignty has been the issue, really, in our relationship with Europe ever since. How much sovereignty? Can we lose it? Are we losing it? Should we lose it? Uh, and so it was a pretty momentous development that. I mean, it, what it basically meant, signing that treaty, was that Britain was slowly coming to terms with its, in my view, its proper new role in the world. 
Now, the Queen has made it clear that she's worried about this because, I mean, she represents the independent British state. And here are the politicians taking away this sovereignty in a globalised world, too. With the signing of the Treaty of Accession in Brussels, Britons were now not only subjects of the Queen, but also citizens of Europe. British sovereignty had been diminished not by defeat in battle, but by a signature on a piece of paper. It also damaged the Queen's traditional position as head of the Commonwealth and jeopardized relations with this far larger community of 53 states allied to the United Kingdom. The Queen had always taken her role as head of the Commonwealth seriously it was part of the legacy of empire, but now its considerations were ignored. It was disgraceful, frankly, the way in which the Foreign Office and successive governments really failed to let the old Commonwealth understand the implications of what this would actually mean. They kept them in the dark for uh, a long time. And as a result now we have people from um, Australia and New Zealand who'd fought at El Alamein having to go through the foreigners channel when they arrive in uh, this country whereas um, everybody else is allowed to go through the fast um, European channel. It's something that of course has um, damaged our relations with uh, the rest of the English-speaking peoples. And if that wasn't enough, the Queen faced another threat to her remaining powers. Ideas of devolution were gaining ground at home, as the Scots, Welsh and Irish were determined to wrest political power away from London. The Queen saw this as a direct challenge. The Constitution made her the head of state of the whole of the United Kingdom, and in a rare step she spoke out to remind people of this. I number kings and queens of England and of Scotland and princes of Wales among my ancestors. And so I can readily understand these aspirations. But I cannot forget that I was crowned Queen of the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland. Three cheers for Her Majesty the Queen. Hip, hip, hip. Despite the politicians, Elizabeth II was determined to retain her authority as head of a united kingdom and as the embodiment of British national identity. But events in Northern Ireland were soon to make her feel even more vulnerable, unable to take her personal safety, let alone her constitutional position, for granted. In the late 1970s, the United Kingdom seemed to be falling apart, riven with political dispute, civil unrest and acts of terrorism. The violence in Ireland had spread to mainland Britain. And for the IRA, the symbolic significance of the royal family made it a key target. On the 27th of August 1979, Prince Philip's uncle, Lord Louis Mountbatten, was on holiday at Mullaghmore off the northwest coast of the Republic of Ireland. He was staying at Classybourne Castle, and until that day the weather had been bad. But that morning the skies cleared and Mountbatten decided to take his family fishing on his boat Shadow 5. Even though it was well known that the family holidayed here every year, and it was at the height of the Irish Troubles, 
Mountbatten dispensed with his bodyguard and the Garda police. He believed that a 79-year-old man was hardly a security risk. But he was wrong. Shortly after half past 11, the IRA blew up the boat. Obviously, the IRA had put in a bomb under the engine, and it was on a, a timer, and they detonated it as the boat was going out to sea. My father had been driving, so mercifully was killed outright. And uh, one of the nephews, the, one of the twins, um, was killed also with him. Um, the other um, was blown further apart. And my sister was found floating face downwards in the water with, I think, only a few seconds of air left in her lungs. I remember very well the bomb going off. Um, and then finding myself in the sea, you know, with a little bits of matchwood all around, which was the boat, but without really realising quite what had happened, of course, because you were half conscious only. And what happened to you then? Well, we were all fished out by... by um, luckily, it was a bank holiday, so in very good weather, and there were a lot of people in, in Donegal Harbour, and... and uh, some of the very, they were very brave and came and literally fished us, you know, out of the water and we were taken into Sligo Hospital and um, stuck together again, really. You are amazed. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, there's, a, a, there's no way around it. We just have to get through it. It's part of the, the you know, the, the trials that go with the job is people sometimes chuck bombs at you. And, uh, you know, they, they deal with it. I think the assassination of Lord Mountbatten uh, came as a near terrible shock to the Queen, but when one also thinks that a short while afterwards there was a shooting incident in the Mall where somebody let off a starting pistol at the Queen during the Trooping of the Colour, There was an element of um, fragility. It must have brought it home to them how they are only a heartbeat away from, uh, from assassination. The member of the family most affected by the death of Mountbatten was Prince Charles. Life will never be the same now that he has gone, he wrote in his diary. In some extraordinary way, he combined grandfather, great-uncle, father, brother, and friend. The following year, the Prince of Wales attended a polo match in Sussex and started talking to a girl about Mountbatten's funeral. The girl sensed the Prince's loneliness and grief and his need for someone to care for him. She was called Lady Diana Spencer. Friday the 20th of November 1992 was the wedding anniversary of the Queen and Prince Philip but the celebrations were interrupted by a telephone call telling Elizabeth that Windsor Castle, her favorite residence, was on fire. The damage was extensive, rebuilding essential. Believing that he was reflecting the national mood, the Tory Heritage Secretary, Peter Brook, announced that since the castle was uninsured, the government would pick up the repair bill estimated at between 20 and 60 million pounds. Uh, I am quite certain that the Queen will want to see her home uh, restored in the way that we would all think fit. At the start of her reign, the decision to pay for the restoration of a castle would have caused little comment. 
But in 1992, the popularity of the Windsors was at its lowest point. After a series of very public rumours and scandals, all three of the Queen's married children were in the process of divorce. Anne and Mark Phillips, Andrew and Sarah, Charles and Diana, and all in the same year. The royal family had lost the goodwill of a great swathe of the public, who were no longer prepared to subsidise their extravagant lifestyle. Down came this entire edifice of morality, of good behaviour, of perfect families, on which she'd built her own family and her reign. You know, this was, this was what she had to offer, this was what she had to give. And here was the absolute concrete proof that within her own family, within her own closest family, these values counted for absolutely nothing. 1992 is not a year on which I shall look back with undiluted pleasure. <clears throat> In the words of one of my more sympathetic correspondents, it has turned out to be an annus horribilis. I think the Windsor Castle fire was a symbol, if you like, of this sort of great immolation of bonfire of the vanities, bonfire of the royalties. And I think it was the sort of first sign of corruption in its sort of loosest sense. You know, the, the idea that a palace could burn down and that the taxpayer would simply foot the bill struck people for the first time as being outrageous. The Queen's situation was not helped by an aggrieved public seizing on the fact that the royal family still didn't pay tax like everyone else. Surely they could pay for the rebuilding of Windsor Castle themselves. We didn't want to pay for treasures that we hadn't seen that were being monopolised by this extraordinarily rich dynasty, um, which didn't uh, pay its fire insurance premiums, for goodness sake. Why should we pay for that? So that there was a great revulsion, I think, against that, and a revulsion a a a against um, the gross inequities. I don't think people wanted a bicycling monarchy necessarily, but they wanted a more modest, a more reasonable, a less, um, a, 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 a less obviously unequal monarchy. The Queen was pragmatic enough to acknowledge the weakness of her position and made a speech at a dinner in the Guildhall. There she admitted that her situation was far from secure. New institution, city, monarchy, whatever should expect to be free from the scrutiny of those who give it their loyalty and support, not to mention those who don't. On the 26th of November 1992, John Major announced that the Queen and the Prince of Wales would pay tax on their private income, starting the following year. Her Majesty, some months ago, she asked me then to consider the basis upon which she might voluntarily pay tax and further suggested that she might take responsibility for certain payments under the current civil list arrangements. The House will be keen to know that the Prince of Wales has made a similar request in regard to the Duchy of Cornwall. The reason the Queen and the Royal Family should pay the same tax as everyone else is that, frankly, it's an absolutely major democratic principle. I don't think people would object to the royal family being richer than most people. Of course, that's not the issue. Of course they shouldn't. Of course you'd have a palace or two, and maybe you could have a flunky or two. But it's the lavish nature of the royal finances compared with other heads of state and the fact that they're above the law on the taxation which really puts them out of kilter. And they're going to have to, at some point... Um, in my view, they're going to have to regularise this if they want the monarchy to remain popular uh, because it's a running sore, frankly, and it's, if you like, another example of the Queen. Uh, although she's been a fairly acceptable monarch to most people, it's another example of the Queen not having reformed the institution of which she's head, and I think that's the major criticism of her reign. I name this ship Britannia. I wish success to her and to all who sail in her. In 
In 1997, the Queen had to face the public's displeasure about her financial arrangements once more, when the government decided not to recommission the royal yacht, the Britannia. A Piper's finale before the families of those who serve and have served on this, the 83rd royal yacht. The Britannia was the scene of many happy memories of both family and Commonwealth. And when it was taken away from her, Elizabeth cried in public for the first time. It was a further warning to the Queen that the financial security of the monarchy could be undermined. That its future funding might be dependent on the royal family's behaviour and on its popularity. On the 31st of August 1997, Diana, Princess of Wales, was killed in a car accident in a Paris underpass. Divorced from Charles the previous year, Diana had always challenged the way in which the royal family behaved. Now, in her death, she tested them again. Whatever one thinks of Diana Spencer, she had a relationship with the folks, us British, that the royal family and the Queen simply didn't have. Queen's distant, remote, white gloves. Um, people sort of think the Queen's a traditional figure, not really to be tampered with for the moment, not okay for her time and we'll keep it going, but no great feeling. And, of course, Diana Spencer was the key to the monarchy continuing, in a way, because she represented the celebrity monarchy. And the celebrity nature of it was she had some connection with the British people. And that, of course, was a threat to the monarchy, because it showed them up. I mean, here was a person who could giggle, laugh, cry like the rest of us. <laughs> I think the monarchy behaved appallingly when she arrived. I mean, she obviously married somebody who, you know, had somebody else, um, and nobody looked after her when she got to the palace. I mean, she, people weren't friendly to her. It was a young, beautiful, hopeful girl, and she needed looking after her. She wasn't looking after her. So she had a lot to get back at them. And I think she did. I think she systematically got at them. So therefore, I think it must have been terrifying for them because there was this gorgeous, glorious creature the whole world was in love with who was their enemy. Through her charity work and her glamour, Diana frequently upstaged the rest of the royal family, making them look boring and out of touch. Diana, Princess of Wales, took on very glamorous charities like AIDS, like landmines. And this must have been tremendously frustrating for the rest of the royal family, who for a hundred years, the royal family has been at the forefront of uh, charity work in the United Kingdom, and many many hours have been put in by the, the Kents and the Gloucesters and you name it in order to, uh, to make people's lives better through charity and yet suddenly the oxygen of publicity was sucked out by this amazing phenomenon on the world stage. But it was in her death that Diana challenged the royal family the most, asking them to show some emotion, to demonstrate that they were human after all. Instead, they went into retreat. Only a few hours after hearing the news at Balmoral, the children were expected to attend church. But there was no mention of the accident nor their mother's death during the service. Outside the confines of Balmoral, there was a national outburst of collective hysteria. By the time the royal family returned to London, it was clear that they had misread the public mood. It must be bred very deeply into royalty 
of terrible things that befall you, you know, if your people lose faith with you and you lose touch with them. To be unloved is almost the worst thing, you know, aside from being beheaded or anything else, that can befall a monarch. And there was the absolutely explicit idea that the loyalty and the love of a large portion of the British people was with her dead and fairly estranged daughter-in-law rather than with the Queen herself. She doesn't really relate to people. I think she can relate to people because of the great gulf fixed between royalty and other people. And th th this, I think, is, is, is part of the problem about monarchy. It creates these, these artificial distinctions. There's a complete failure to empathise with how people feel, and I think that was the problem over the Diana's death. The government advised the Queen that the only way in which she could regain the nation's trust was to speak directly to the people. What I say to you now, as your Queen and as a grandmother, I say from my heart. First, I want to pay tribute to Diana myself. She was an exceptional and gifted human being. In good times and bad, she never lost her capacity to smile and laugh nor to inspire others with her warmth and kindness. You felt that those words must have been almost wrenched out of her. You know, this just isn't the way she behaves. Not particularly f f for any reasons concerning Diana, but just that she's sort of an emotional person who, who likes not to let her feelings show. And to have to... Um, sort of reach out to people, you could almost see the strain on her. Diana's death had made the Queen realise that she could no longer take the affection of the British people for granted. In April 2005, Elizabeth II allowed her son Charles to do what her uncle Edward VIII could not, marry a divorcee. Although she had never liked changing her moral position, the Queen was pragmatic enough to recognise that if she gave the marriage her blessing, then it might prevent future problems for Charles. Charles has said that his relationship is non-negotiable. And I think that the Queen has been bested. It must have hurt her and um, infuriated her, actually, that there was this woman who was taking quite a public role um, who, in, in a relationship outside marriage. So which is worse, to have that sort of very public relationship outside marriage or to marry a divorcee, which is one of the great taboos ever since the abdication and Margaret and Peter Townsend um, within the royal family. And I think in the end she just chose the least worst thing. Charles, have you resolved to be faithful to your wife, forsaking all others so long as you both shall live? That is my resolve with the help of God. As head of the Church of England, the Queen had always had reservations about the remarriage of divorcees. So long as you both shall live. But she knew that the future of the monarchy would be more secure if Camilla was Charles's wife rather than his mistress. She is going to become queen. This is something that uh, the palace is not really levelling with us about, but uh, it will happen, and it's right that it should. The point is that under British law, a wife has the same rank and status as the husband, and you can't really um, muck about with things like that. It's something that is not going to be understood abroad, apart from anything else, to have a king of England and a duchess as his uh, wife. It's an absurdity. The wife of a king is a queen, and it's as easy as that. The 
queen has done all that she can to ensure a smooth succession after her death. She has kept firm the values of continuity and consistency, only changing when she has been forced to do so, or when she has felt the future of the monarchy to be at stake. But has this very consistency delayed the creation of a modern monarchy? She came in at an age when Britain was an entirely different place to the country it is now. Things have changed beyond recognition in terms of, of personal morality, in terms of what people believe in, spend, wear, the way people behave, the way they want their families, their institutions to work. And through all that, the Queen's... Um, absolute guiding principle has been to, um, stay, to change as, as little as possible, which is a crazy way to behave. You know, you can't run a modern monarchy on those lines. Sooner or later, things will catch up with you. I mean, when she took over, the whole thing was looking rather anachronistic. Now it just looks like an institution really in the dark ages. The British people want to have it both ways. British people buy all the gossip, uh, true or false, uh, about the royal family. They do a lot of tut-tutting and things aren't where they were. They're rather, uh, they fasten on tiny things, uh, like Prince Harry and the swastika, nonsensical stories that are blown up, and the public rather enjoy all that. But when it comes to something quite different, like the death of the Queen Mother, um, the mood completely changes. And the same people queue for hours, for miles, to pass through Westminster Hall. The magic hasn't gone, and the crowds are in the mall, uh, just as they were on VA Day all through the uh, Queen Victoria's Jubilee. I think what's happened during the Queen's reign is that there has been an erosion, you know, she's no longer an, an imperial monarch. I sometimes think of her, I mean, John Osborne called, called the monarchy the, a, a gold filling in a mouthful of decay. And I think there's something, there's something uh, in that image, you know, that there she is, the, the lords have gone, the family's gone, the empire's gone, you know, but the gold filling is still there. There's been an incredible amount of change that's taken place over the years since 1952. We're in many ways a completely different country. But one thing that has stayed unchanging is the Queen, her attitude towards her duty, her attitude towards honour, towards religion, towards dignity, and she allows a sense of majesty, of genuine majesty, into a modern world which is pretty devoid of all the things I've just mentioned. Over 50 years, Elizabeth II has reigned with a clear moral purpose. She has done her duty. But has she done enough to preserve the monarchy? I think the monarchy as an institution is not going to last much beyond the Queen uh, leaving the throne, dying or leaving the throne or abdicating. And in my view, that's why she hasn't. Because I think there may be something in Elizabeth which senses that she is really going to be the last acceptable monarch.